Welcome to our second session uh, on living issues. And I, I want to start today um, with kind of hoping to give you an idea of the way I'm trying to go through this. So our intent is to basically come to understand uh, how we have these different expressions of Christianity today. Uh, some would call them sex, some would call them uh, denominations, uh, and even some might even say that they're cults, some are the cults. Uh, but by and large, most folks would, you know, would look at us as if we were a, a one homogenous group, and that is, uh, you know, that we are just Christians. And so what, I, what I'm trying to do is to let us know that we're not different or separated today because of worship style, <laughs> all right? Uh, I, I seem to hear a lot of that today. That you know, if you go to the Baptist church, then you know they ain't gonna have no spirit in them. You go to the Kojic church, and and you know that's where you find the Holy Ghost. I actually had uh, a member some years ago who actually told me she she left the church and said the reason for leaving was that, that she came here and she got the knowledge that she needed, mm -hmm. but she was going somewhere else so that she could learn about the Holy Spirit. Mm. Okay. <laughs> wow. Right, and, uh, wow. you know, which which of course told me that you didn't really get the knowledge that you needed in the first place. You need to stay put for a while. So um, the the idea here is that we can see the development of these different doctrines historically, uh, and again over a period of you know really now these two thousand years or so. Uh, we can see these expressions today and we'll know uh, how we come to some of these uh, different doctrinal understandings. And it's those doctrinal understandings that uh, I don't even want to say separate us, but that allow us the freedom to have different expressions of our faith, knowing that we are still one faith serving one Lord under one baptism. Right. And so I want to start uh, tonight by uh, going back to the early church, the church mm -hmm. as it begins to develop following the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. Uh, as they began preaching, you have so many folks who join. You know, Peter on the day of Pentecost goes out to preach and 3,000 folks saved. are saved. What we forget is that probably most, if not all, of those 3,000 were Jews. Either, either Jews by, by birth or proselyte Jews. But they were uh, they were Jews in the early in the beginning. So the early church was a Jewish church. And I think that if you begin to understand that even the Jewish church had its own division, you'll get a better look at the Christian church and come to understand that we we come to this knowing that there are different expressions of faith. Uh, and most folks who've read the Bible know that there are basically four groups or four sects inside uh, of the Jewish church at the time of Christ. Now, there are even more today, all right? There are many more today. Uh, but at the time of Christ, there were basically four. First, uh, and the most well-known were the Pharisees. Pharisees. And the Pharisees were those uh, who were, you know, the, the models for the observance of the law. They were strict. 
They were traditionalists, all right? And they wanted to, they had a strict interpretation of the written law, but then they themselves became, uh, became the example of the oral law, all right? So if a Pharisee, you went to the priest and the priest said, you know, you know, or you were sick and you got healed. Jesus did once. He said, go show yourself to the priest. That priest is a Pharisee. And the Pharisee can determine by oral law that it is, that it is so, right? So the Pharisee, basically, if you didn't know all 613 uh, of the written no. law, your best bet of, of staying faithful was to look at what a Pharisee did and do what the Pharisee did. Mm. Now, because they they were set up, I, I, I don't know if I want to say they set themselves up, but just to say they were set up to uh, as that example of the moral law, keeping of the law, all of it, moral, ceremonial, uh, that they began to take on this uh, aura of superiority over any other groups uh, of Jews who would practice the faith. One of the hallmark uh, beliefs of the Pharisees, however, is that Pharisees believe in the resurrection. That distinguished them, or, or probably the, the greatest distinguishing mark between them and the Sadducees, which is the second uh, set. Uh, the Sadducees basically rejected the oral Torah or the oral tradition. They were more aristocratic and aloof. They were more well-off. And, and so they said, no, we're gonna stay with the written law. We don't wanna hear what those pompous Pharisees have to say about what it means. We're gonna stay with that. And only the written Torah, only those 613 laws uh, become divine authority for us. And they rejected the resurrection. Now, I'm, I'm laying this groundwork because as the early church, the Christian church begins to develop, these are the people who are joining. Because he's got all of this stuff there. So when they join, of course, they bring their predispositions with them. Mm -hmm. the third group was actually a pharisaic group but they they focused in on the political uh, relationships in in israel and uh, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna i, I think uh make a <laughs> Uh, a comparison here, but but the Herodians were the third group, and they were they were basically Hellenistic Jews, uh, Jews who either were born and raised outside of Israel, and or had converted to Judaism, and most of them uh, looked at the politics of the of what was going on between Israel and the dominant nation at the time, which was Rome. Their idea was that their salvation was tied up into their fidelity to the line of Herod. Right? So not so much the line of David uh, as the Messiah coming through, but the line of Herod. Herod was the king during the Roman, if there was anyone that was going to free them from Roman oppression, it had to be a descendant of Herod. So what they ended up doing is they elevated their political affiliation above their religious affiliation. We haven't, we haven't seen any of that lately, have we? <laughs> right? Uh, some of us, this modern evangelicalism uh, and, and most especially uh, Trumpism <laughs> is huh? is kind of a I guess a recooking 
of the Herodians uh, in, the, in the Jewish church. And then the fourth group uh, were the Essenes or the Essenes. And they were a, an, an aesthetic uh, sect. They lived in highly organized groups. They, they mostly stayed away from the city. They lived out in the countryside. The, probably the most famous Essene in the New Testament is John the Baptist, mm. who, you know, who, who wore camel hair, right? And lived on a uh, diet of honey hair and honey. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. it's believed that, you know, our most uh, our most ancient copies of the Bible come from uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in 1948. And it's believed that those Dead Sea Scrolls were written by a community of the Essenes who lived outside of, of Jerusalem. And you, you'll get this idea because some of their practices, you see the early church uh, taking on. For instance, when uh, you're reading Acts that, that the early church came together and they sold their belongings and they had all things in common, all right? That is something that was done by the Essenes. So you get that kind of influence coming out of these four sects of the Jewish church finding its expression in the early Christian church, right? Any questions, comments? Okay, so according to its own record, the church is one, right? We, we might have, a, you know, scores of denominations, but that doesn't mean we have scores of the Christian church. We have one church and we are one because the church is the body of Christ and he is the head of it. Now, what we find ourselves wrestling with, not just today, but historically, is that the reality of the church that we see and visualize seems to be a far cry from this ideal of Christian unity, right? Again, that's where this whole discussion began. We've got so many different denominations, so many different persuasions uh, of the Christian faith. How can we be one when we're, we're all over the map, right? Yeah. Right? But the fact of the matter is we are, and as we go through, you'll, you will see how you know, there are some basic things, basic beliefs that make us one. And, and we're going to kind of get to where we, that, that's really, you know, my, my roadmap. We'll deal with Christology today. We'll deal with so, uh, soteriology next week. And then we'll follow that up uh, with scripture, you know, our belief in scripture. So when we see those basic things, what do we believe about Jesus? What do we believe about salvation? What do we believe about the Bible? Those core things we we all seem to agree on, even if we may, you know, our practice of that might be different, right? So in the two, in the New Testament, we see uh, different groups who claim to be Christian, uh, particularly in in the Book of Acts and in the letters. Uh, once we come out of the, the church, uh, you know, the early church in the first few chapters of Acts, we run across John's disciples who are preaching the gospel. We find the Judaizers and we find the Hellenists. All three of those groups claim to be believers but they all have different persuasions, right? Now, so in Acts chapter 18, verse 24, we are introduced to one of the greatest preachers in the New Testament, right? 
you know, we don't we take Jesus out of that because he is the greatest. All right. But but Paul even says, listen, you know, uh, I'm not eloquent of speech like some of these other fellows. That's why Barnabas, you know, uh, really was on that first missionary journey because Barnabas was considered to be a much better speaker. But Paul reasoned the gospel out a little better than everyone else. All right? Do I need to ask you all to put it all on mute? Oh, no. Yeah. All right. All right. So in Acts 24, we run across Apollos. I mean, or rather, Acts 18, verse 24. We run across Apollos. And when you read that, it says, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, right? A Jew born in Egypt, born in Africa. I want to get, get my blacks in the Bible. All right. Apollos is a black preacher. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it says he was eloquent and mighty in the scriptures, and he came to Ephesus. Right. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord being fervent in the spirit and spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. I want to get that because, you know, we talked about Lordship uh, last week. So here is Apollos preaching Jesus, eloquent, knowing his Bible. However, his understanding of Jesus and of Christianity was limited because he knew only the baptism of John. He didn't know that there was anything other than the baptism of John. In Acts chapter 19, verse 1, we run into some more folks who come to Ephesus. That is uh, yeah, we, we end up with, with, with Aquila and Priscilla, but those folks were all disciples of John who had, who didn't know that there was any such thing as the Holy Spirit. So the thing I want to get across to us is that, you know, we don't, we don't question their sincerity as Christians. We don't doubt their faith in Jesus. However, their understanding of that faith and what it meant to be a Christian was lacking. And so we see that happening historically all the time. Folks can take a little knowledge of Christ. They can be sincere in what they know. But if you don't, you know, if you stay on the milk of the word and never get to the meat of the word, then you may find out that your understanding of what you really thought was real faith is really short. I wish the whole church was in Bible class. It'd make mm -hmm. my job a whole lot easier. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. So John's disciples were were Christian. However, however, they were their their understanding was was lacking and short. So. Uh, Reverend Kerr asked, do you believe those 12 men were saved when they had no Holy Spirit? I'm going to say no. But they thought they were. They were sincere in their, in their commitment to the Christian faith. right? And I think that's important because there are a lot of people today who are sincere, but if they don't really know that they need the Holy Spirit in their life or they don't understand what it means to be, you know, uh, to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, then, you know, that there, there needs to be some more discipling done in order to bring them into a full understanding. So we ought, you know, we ought, we ought never assume that everybody who comes to church actually knows what's going on, right? Deacon Ross, are you on? Yes, sir. All right, because I think that's your phone. That's can you oh, mute? Yeah. can you mute it? Okay. All right. I will so do. All right, here we go. We're clear. All right. 
Okay. All right, now, in the New Testament, you have the second group, the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were a group of Jewish Christians who insisted that anybody else who would come into the Christian church had to first obey the Mosaic law so that if Gentiles were to become Christians, they had to go through circumcision and go through all of the rituals uh, that one had to go through in order to become uh, a, a Jew, you know, a proselyte Jew, right? So they put that uh, on everyone who wanted to come in to become a part of the church. They put that prescription on them that they had to learn uh, or they had to do those those things that others had to do to become uh, to become Christian, right? All right. So the Judaizers, when you go through the the letters of Paul, you run into them, uh, find that they they agree with most of what we call the apostles' doctrine, right? but they wanted to regulate the Gentiles, right? So they, they believed, but they wanted, they wanted other folks who came in who weren't like them to have to go through certain processes in order to become like them, right? Acts chapter 15. Verse, verse one, it says, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved, right? And you will discover sometimes even in modern Christian movements that folk will, will put other stipulations on salvation in order to become, uh, you know, a part of the Christian church other than what, what uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 9, confess with your heart the Lord Jesus, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So those, those things, uh, again, we find folks will put some other things up. Sister Powell, you have a question? Yeah, is this the same, uh, exactly like when, because uh, we, we were studying Ezra, in Sunday school, and when the people came back out of captivity, they had put stipulations on some of those who came back in those groups and said they had to be circumcised in order to, is this the same? It's, it's not the same. No, it's not the same because uh, those who had been away in captivity, some of them had been born, they were bringing them back into the pure Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. right. Here, what we have here, we have Jews who've converted to Christianity. They've but accepted they, Jesus as Lord, but and some of them that came back weren't uh, weren't Jews either. But they had to they put stipulations on those too that they had to do certain things in order to become in order to become a Jew, mm -hmm. right? But but you but that's not the same as what's happening in the New Testament because okay. uh, if they were becoming a Jew, they would still have to do all those stipulations that they did in Ezra. However. Mm -hmm what the Jewish Christians were doing, some of them were saying that if anybody else wanted to become a Christian, mm -hmm. you had to first become a Jew in order to become a Christian. Oh, okay. I see. Right. 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 Okay. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. You know, they, they, I mean, they taught it, they practiced it, the Judaizers. And, and really, when you read through uh, some of the letters of Paul, particularly Galatians, you, you see him really dealing with these folks because they followed him, <laughs> right? He would set up a church in the Gentile region and leave and, and go to another city, and the Judaizers would come behind him and tell all of those Gentiles that he had just won to Jesus, you ain't saved yet. You got to be circumcised first. 
So Paul, Paul had a real hard time uh, dealing with the Judaizers and their traditional stipulations that they put on new converts to Christ. All right. I thought I thought I'd put it like that because sometimes in in our regular church expressions, you know, we ain't got to go from denomination to denomination. We just go from church to church. We will we can put stipulations on new folk. If, if they're really gonna be members of our church, that they they have to do some of the stuff that we want them to do in order for them to be, you know, quote, accepted, end quote. And you can see Paul's response to them in Galatians chapter six, uh, starting with verse 11. Paul wanted to set the record straight uh, that, that that was not true. And he showed how important it was, you know, most of the letters of Paul, really almost all of them, Paul dictated to somebody else. And then they wrote down what he, it, he said, and they sent it to those churches. But when he got to chapter six, verse 11, and he wanted to straighten out this Judaizer thing, uh, you see Paul said in verse 11, chapter six, you see how large a letter I've written unto you with my own hand, right? Paul couldn't see well, so he wrote big boxcar letters, all right? And uh, he said, I wrote it with my own hands as, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Right? So he kind of sets that record straight with him. Then the third group that I want to lift up are the Hellenists. And that the, the phrase Hellenists or the term Hellenists really uh, applies to Greek-speaking Jews. Right? Of course, if the early church comes out of the Jewish church, then, of course, you know we have the Greek-speaking Christians, right? So the Hellenists as a body, again, are those who are proselyte Jews. It means they come from foreign parentage, uh, or they are born outside of Jerusalem or outside of Israel. Uh, they, or they settle in, in other areas and they've adopted the culture of that region. And then also those, you know, who have, who speak Greek, who have a Greek dialect, they're basically Gentiles, right? And so Acts chapter six is a, is a real classic uh, confrontation with, with the Hellenists. Uh, and we use this passage to suggest why we need deacons in church. Because it says in those days when the number of disciples is multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, that's the Jews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration, right? They didn't speak the same language. They were all Christians, but the Jewish Christians understood Hebrew, right? But the, but the uh, Greek-speaking Christians did not. And so they were being left out because they weren't communicating with, with each other. And so they selected seven deacons, or seven men, we call them deacons now, who, who would go and, and meet the needs of those Hellenistic uh, Christians, right? Right. So again, from Acts chapter two, you see the church growing. <sighs> Growing under the power of the spirit, growing as a community. Uh, you can see all the things that they do. Uh, Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47 is really a, kind of a, a verse that sums up the life of the early church. It says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. 
And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That is the word uh, of, of what Jesus did, what Jesus taught, and who Jesus was from word of mouth from the apostles. Right? And, and in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then there's this organized uh, life among them and an organized uh organized life and, and an organized worship. Yeah, so Sister Rucker asked if this time period is after Christ's resurrection and these groups were forming their own form of denominations. Uh, I don't know if I would call them form of denominations. Uh, some of them actually become more like sex. So they, they actually a little, uh, uh, as the time goes by, become a little stronger than denominations. Uh, some of them actually end up uh, being driven out of the church, right? Uh, but yes, this is the time after the resurrection of Jesus. All right. So as soon as the church gets started and starts to grow, you, you get this challenge uh, to this new movement, the challenges of, of uh, what it means to, to live a life of Christian fellowship, right? That's, that's what's that whole episode with uh, Ananias and Sapphira in chapter five is about. And then again, the murmuring of the Hellenistic uh, Christians in chapter six, right? All right, any other questions before I move on? Okay, so I wanna start taking a look at the, at the idea of Christology. Uh, looking at last week, we talked about what did Jesus think about himself, who he was, you know. Uh, now we wanna look at what the early church uh, believed about Jesus and those sects uh, and movements that were in competition with what the apostles were, were putting out. As you can imagine, you know, by 100 AD, most of the apostles are gone. Well, all of them are gone. They're all dead. So now we start trying to pull together the words of the apostles, what they said about Jesus, and, and put it into some kind of organized form. Uh, the apostles' doctrine is a word of mouth uh, thing. Uh, and, of course, the letters of Paul, as he sends them out, explaining what uh, the apostles said really mean, all right? So the unity of the church, as it begins to, to be scattered abroad, uh, you know, early on, from the day of Pentecost uh, to the persecution by Saul, uh, ultimately to the dispersion uh, in 70 AD by the Romans. Uh, as the church begins to scatter uh, out across the globe, two things held them together as one community, right? One is a common faith. It's what is it that we believe about Jesus? And the second one is a common way of ordering life and worship. And kind of to, you know, that, that could be a whole nother class, that second one. But let me try to narrow it down into basically two things. Uh, that when they gathered for worship, they had communion and they baptized, <laughs> right? Those were the two ordinances. Now, uh, early on, and, and you'll see Paul writing later that they ought to give it up, they had the love feast, right? The fellowship dinner. And because they didn't, you know, they started discriminating against people in that, Paul said, get rid of it, <laughs> right? So, that, that common way of ordering their life, having all things in common, uh, worshiping together, uh, learning the apostles' doctrine, living a life, going, uh, you know, uh, exercising or, or experiencing baptism and, and the Lord's Supper because Jesus said do it. Now, historically, as we go on, we will discover, uh, particularly when we start to get into the you know, the 16th century, 
that even though all of the Christian churches did it, they did baptism, they did the Lord's Supper, uh, you'll, you'll see baptism changing around the 8th century, or actually earlier than that, at the 6th century, you see uh, baptism changing, but also later on you see the, the idea of communion changing. Uh, not the basic uh, ordinance that we ought to do it, but a, an understanding of what happens when you do it, right? Or in the case of baptism, how should it be done? Right? John the Baptist took Jesus down in the water, all right? And he came up out of the water, right? That it is, it's commonly understood that that speaking of immersion, he took him under the water and brought him up, right? But uh, maybe three, 400 years later, uh, the first Christian, uh, uh, he called himself Christian Emperor of Rome, did, was so sick, was on his deathbed, nobody wanted to put him under the water because they were afraid that if he died, they would be blamed for killing the emperor. So they sprinkled him. And so sprinkling becomes uh, a way of baptism, right? And then as other denominations begin to form historically, you know, you get some who say, listen, we can't, you know, it, it has to be more de demonstrative than that laying folk down in the water, pulling them up. So you get folks saying, you got to dunk them, all right? You got to drop them down in their water and then pull them up. Then, of course, you got like the Methodist who says it doesn't really matter. Choose the method that you want as long as you do it. Right. And then when it comes to the Lord's Supper, folks start asking what actually happens. Am I actually eating the body and eating the blood of Jesus? Right. Well, nobody, they didn't want to do that because no, they didn't want the church to be accused of being cannibals. Right? Now, that's the reason a lot of disciples left Jesus. When you read John chapter six, because they they thought he was talking about them becoming cannibals. They said, oh, no, we don't want nothing to do with this. And but then you get the Catholic Church. Uh, saying of the Roman Catholic Church, saying that that bread actually becomes the body of Christ in you. So you have a piece of the sinless body of Christ in you when you take the bread. And that wine actually becomes the blood of Jesus. So when you take that wine, you actually have his pure blood running through your veins which is one reason why the priest dips the bread, the wafer in the wine, and then gives it to the, the participant. And only the priest gets to drink the wine because he needs more grace than everybody else. And then you, with, with uh, the, the Lutheran Reformation, uh, in the 16th century, you have, in the, uh, in the early 17th century, you have the, Lutheran saying it's not really the body and blood of Jesus, but in some strange, miraculous way, whenever you take it, the body and blood of Jesus are actually present in that moment. Right? That's called the doctrine of consubstantiation. Catholic version is called transubstantiation. And then with the rise of the Baptist church, you get more of the free folk who say, doesn't mean any of those things. It just means it represents his body and it represents his blood. But it does not change our common faith, our belief that we ought to be baptized, we ought to take the Lord's Supper because Jesus commanded us to do it, right? That's a part of our worship, it's a part of the order of our life. You know, as often as you do it, Catholics do it every time they open the doors, right? Right? We do it once a month. All right. So whenever you do it, uh, it's, it does not change. So we're still unified. We're one in our common faith and our common practice. What we think happens might differ. But that, those differences are not large enough to split us from the faith. So as the church begins to scatter, it's still uh, uh, one church, but its unity is, is threatened. Uh, you know, but they kept their loyalty, their faithfulness to the person and work of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus. 
But as the early church begins to develop, we get basically three doctrines that start to challenge the unity of the church. And over the course of 300 years, the church deals with these doctrines and eventually the proponents of all three are, I don't want to say exercised from the church, all right? Right? They, they, are, they are separated from the church. The church comes to make a statement to say, if you don't believe this, then you are not a Christian. And so those who for 300 years considered themselves to be Christians uh, uh, were through orthodox uh, discussion set aside, set apart. So those three doctrines are Gnosticism, Arianism, and docetism. I'm, and and I, I tell you all, I hated this stuff when I was in school. <laughs> now I find myself having to teach it, right? So Gnosticism uh, is a general term used to refer to what I want to call a uh, theosophical, right? Theological theology and philosophy. They combine them. It's a syncretistic uh, idea of Christianity. In other words, you take something from uh, the Greek philosophy, something from the word of God, and you merge them together into something different. And so Gnostics uh, kind of adapted Christianity with this syncretistic idea, and they claimed that they could do that because they claimed that they had a more profound wisdom and possessed a deeper uh, mystical experience than other Christians, right? Gnosticism, gnosis, which means knowledge. They had knowledge, they claimed to have knowledge that the regular run-of-the-mill Christian didn't have. I think inherent in their, in their uh, understanding or this Gnostic doctrine is that they were also dualists. And a dualist is one who says that the spirit is everything and the body is nothing. So it, it sets up this tension between the resurrection and the immortality of the soul. They basically took the Greek philosophy that says that a human being is nothing more than an eternal soul stuck in the mud of a human body. So the body means nothing. What has to happen is you have to free your spirit. That's where immortality is. So there's, there's no need for a resurrection of the body because the body doesn't mean anything. And these were early Christians who were, who were pushing this, this kind of philosophy or, or uh, theo, theos, I don't know, this theological philosophy that, uh, you know, you don't need a resurrection. No sense in, in arguing over the, whether Jesus rose or not, because that's not important, because the body isn't important. What's important is, is freeing the soul, you know, from the mud of humanity. As a matter of fact, not only did they say the body is nothing, they actually said the body is evil, so that you've got to free your immortal soul from the, this evil that it is stuck in, which is the human body. And so, of course, their idea is to raise their consciousness to the level of the thinking of Jesus so that you don't need uh, the actual crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. That's unnecessary. Today, we call them neo Gnostics, or better, better known as the New Age movement. Right? It is a, it's a different spirituality that basically says, you know, just forget about all that stuff. Get your mind raised. Get your mind out of the dirt. All right. Raise your mind to a higher level. Right. And if you can raise your mind above the mundane things of this world, the sinfulness, the dirt of this world, then you have already attained 
attain immortality because you've set your spirit free, right? And, and so we see those kind of expressions going on today. Sister Turner? A rebel love. So what I'm hearing, I think you're saying also is that they do not believe in redemption. No, they do believe in redemption, but it's a works righteousness redemption. Right. You do it yourself. Okay, but not Jesus Christ redeem, redeeming us then. No, you don't need okay. it. Oh, that's there. Oh, that's there for life. Okay. Okay. They have that. Okay, I understand. Okay, thank you. Okay. Digging, digging crowd asked, what's the difference between a Gnostic and an agnostic? Agnostic, that was just when they asked you the same thing. So uh, again, a Gnostic is one who claims to have special knowledge, mm -hmm. right? A deeper mystical <laughs> understanding. An agnostic is almost the complete opposite. An agnostic says, I don't know if God exists, so I don't have any knowledge. And secondly, I don't care if God exists. All right. So if he does, I'll, I'll find out when it's time. But I ain't going to worry about it. All right. So an agnostic does not say, I don't believe in God. He says, I just don't care whether he exists or not. But don't they believe on a higher level? Because I was listening to some of that stuff Kanye West is into now. And they believe in a deeper spiritual reality because he said he's an agnostic. Yeah, he yeah, but, but he don't know what he's talking about. Okay. He might he might be an agnostic, but he's an agnostic gnostic. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because if he thinks he has a deeper Early understanding, uh, you know, you know, he he's he's actually got a very high opinion of himself. He's yes, he does. But he spells it G-E-E-N-U-S. All right. Mm. So so uh yeah, it's uh It claims deeper understanding. So it, it's really a part. And I think what he's doing is this part of this new age movement. You know, the stuff that he does, you know, even when he was going around with those concerts on Sunday, bringing everybody out to the lakefront. And that, you know, it, it basically was saying, you don't need a common worship. You don't need a common uh, way of, of Christian life and practice. All you need to come in here and raise your level of praise up and you'll be saved. And a lot of, lot of young people uh, follow fell for that, you know. They follow him. He got a big following. Yeah, and I and I had a whole lot of discussions with a lot of because you know the concerts were great, <laughs> all right. And so I have a problem to say go ahead and listen to the music, but understand what the movement is, and don't fall for you know, the okie doke of this Gnostic idea, the Gnostic illusion, which is what it is. You know, it's, again, it's syncretistic. It takes something from here, here. So he's taking stuff from hip hop, taking stuff from the gospel, from the church and the gospel and putting it in together and trying to form some new and deeper mystic movement, right? That is Gnosticism uh, at its basic. Six core beliefs of Gnosticism. First one is that the physical world is imperfect. Now, there are a number of religions that believe the same thing. Buddhism, for one, right? That the world is filled with suffering. The earth and all of God's creation are flawed. All right? I want you to get that. Because the moment you say that all of God's creations are flawed, you make God flawed. So the whole physical world is flawed, but it's not imperfect because of, of, of those Gnostics who have that deeper understanding, right? And of other creations, there's some other beings in there who can help guide you, you know, your chakras or your, <laughs> you know, that, that can help guide you, you know, your, your spirit animal, some other uh, religions, those things that can guide you to the right pathway, right? The second one is that, that really there is a Gnostic God, right? In, in neo-Gnosticism, this New Age movement, right? There, there is one ultimate God who creates the whole universe, but he didn't create the universe from nothing. 
He created it from himself. I want you to see th that point one and point two don't even match because if everything he created is flawed and he created it from himself, then he's flawed. Then he's a flawed God. So you can't say <laughs> that, that there's, a, there's this ultimate, you know, ultimate God, right? Right. right. But if you say that God created everything out of himself, then you you have you the, the next step is that everything in creation has some part of God in it. So everything around us, right? I'm gonna pick on my one of my favorite sci-fi series, and that's Star Wars. Let the for, may the force be with you. Right, hmm. right. It's in everything. Yes. Right, mm -hmm. the trees, the rock, the bird. Mm -hmm. All right, in everything. That's a gnostic idea. Right. That's a gnostic idea that uh, God is in everything. God's in the rock. Right. Uh, he's in all the in inanimate objects. That's that's the the god of gnosticism is actually this created order. Right. And then Gnosticism, thirdly, has some intermediary deities, right? They call them aeons, right? Or your special angel, right? That stand between humans and God. And they help God to do certain things for humanity. Right? Mm. So when you can tap into your special angel, your special aeon, then, then that will get you quicker uh, into this mystic perfection. Uh, salvation and Gnosticism. Right. And, and I, I want you all to know that, that when I use the word people there, that's not a, that's not a, a, a mistake with the tense, right? Well, me, every person, every people, all right. Uh, I could have said, peoples, right, of the earth. But everyone on the earth has, has to pay attention to their spiritual health, right? You, everyone should seek salvation through special knowledge, gnosis. And only through that gnosis or that salvation will you be able to become one with God, right? Now, we, we've got so many expressions of that today, right? Uh, you know, we got one real close to us, right on 119th National, right? Got to have that special knowing, special gnosis to become one with God. And their claim for salvation is that, that, that this knowing is in every human being. But it doesn't mean that every human being will find salvation because every human being will not tap into it. Right? which means that it becomes my responsibility to save myself by tapping into the special knowing that is already in me, right? I got to go get some crystals to help me meditate and concentrate so I can unleash the power that's in me and burn some special incense or whatever. You, know, you got a lot of that stuff going on today, right? That's only, that, that spiritual wisdom is what brings you into it. And it's only through that where you find this clear path to salvation, right? Okay. Question? All right. All right. Gnosticism has no rules. <laughs> All right. Gnostics reject rules. They believe that a person doesn't, I said don't, but a person doesn't need rules to achieve salvation. Your salvation comes from within, through your individual practice. Let me, let me see if I can uh, get you to see how that is worked out in modern religious talk. You got to learn how to find your own truth. Oh. Your truth is your truth, and my truth is mine, and both of them are right. So you have to learn to practice. <laughs> you have to learn to practice your own truth, right? Right? So you have your own individual practice. So everyone is right in their own mind. 
think the Bible talks about that, right? Right? And we, you know, we, yeah, we become righteous in our own mind. And we are, we are encouraged, you know, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can know what is that good and perfect will of God, right? And then finally, Gnostics believe in the destiny of, of humanity, that every person on earth has a fate, that you have to find your special knowledge before you die. Otherwise, you got two options. If you don't find your special knowledge before you die, your gnosis, then you may be trapped in the realm of hell, basically. All right, different levels depending on how close you got to your to your special knowing. How do you say that word right there, Reverend Law? Demiurge. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, you might be forced to be reborn. So it is a, in some sense the idea of reincarnation. Come back to uh, Christ Universal Temple over here on 119th Street. I don't know if the members be really believe that, but I do know that Johnny Coleman believed, you know, that that she had been here once or twice before, and that she had finally grown to that point of spiritual growth where she had found her special knowing. Because in a previous lifetime she didn't find it, she was forced to to be born again or be reborn, and had to do life all over again. So she got another chance to find salvation, right? And of course, those who, who find that special knowing, who raise their consciousness up to the level of Christ. So we got a lot of Christ consciousness movement today. Uh, those are the ones who find union uh, with God. Okay, that's Gnosticism. I told you we was gonna need the whole hour and a half, right? <laughs> Wow. The next one is Arianism. Like Sister Coma said, said all oh, this stuff is more confusing than Jesus. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, Arius was a was a Christian presbyter, right? A deacon, uh, church leader. Again, from Alexandria, Egypt. And he taught that you know, Jesus. Christ was the son of God who was begotten in time by the father. So I want you to get this. He's not equal with the father, okay. but that he is created by the father out of himself in time. Right? So once uh, God creates the universe, he creates the son and gives him responsibilities. But the son is a created being. Right? Now, when it comes to Arianism, there are two possibilities for us. You either affirm the unity and deny the plurality in God, right? Or you deny the unity and you affirm the plurality of God. So it's, you know, it, it's about the, and, it, and it's not just Jesus, it's the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They can't be equal with God. They have to be less with him, right? And so all of these religious expressions in Arianism revolve around these two choices. Modern day Arianism is best seen in the Jehovah's Witnesses. You, you listen to their doctrine or you read their doctrine, read a watchtower, I, you know, I hope you, you have to be a strong Christian to read that stuff so you don't get thrown off. But um, they have the same kind of beliefs that Arius did uh, in the third century uh, AD, that the only begotten of the Son is Jesus, who is produced or created by Jehovah. That's a 
That's a Jehovah's Witness doctrine, right? Okay. And then that the son is the firstborn, meaning in, in Jehovah's Witness doctrine, the first created being of all creation. And then by him, he creates everything else. So God creates Jesus and then turns over the work of universal creation to Jesus, which means that Jesus in the Jehovah's Witness doctrine is the second greatest personage in the universe. God is first, Jesus is second. So is it, are they saying then that Jesus created Adam? Yes, he created everything after he, he himself was created. So that John 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was God, and the word was with God. You ever read that in, in the New World Translation, it'll be different. Mm. They'll talk about the son being, being uh, begotten of the father, and it is the son who creates everything else. Mm. Is this where the Aryan race comes out of? No, ma'am. Completely different. <laughs> Completely different. Yeah. Uh, so Arianism believes that the Bible is God's written word to humankind, right? Jehovah's Witnesses believe it too. Uh, they would say he used some 40 human secretaries over a period of 16 centuries to record it. But God himself actively directed the writing by his spirit. Thus, it is, it is inspired by God, right? Mm -hmm. Now, but God has provided his visible mm. organization, Jehovah's Witnesses, made up of spirit anointed people to help Christians in all nations to understand and apply properly the Bible to their lives. That's why they have a New World Translation. Right? So, Arianism, in some sense, can be Gnostic in itself because they will say they're the only ones who have real knowledge and it's found in their translation uh, of the Bible uh, and that uh, unless they tell you what it means and how and how to apply it to your life you don't you don't have what it takes to be saved Pastor, can we add want to check and make sure their devices are muted if they're not speaking? Yeah, I've been trying to go through it and do it. But we keep we, we keep opening them back up after I mute them. <laughs> All, right. All right. So Jehovah Witness said you need them to tell you how to make the word of God make sense in your life and how to apply it. All right. And it's interesting, the New World Translation, uh, it was, uh, that translation was, was written by a man who, uh, hold on a second, y'all, my son came in to hug me. On oh, his birthday, his birthday. See <laughs> Happy birthday, B. Thank you. Yeah, that, that they, uh, See, made me lose my train of thought, just like that. What was I saying, Brian? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, New World <laughs> you asked me other old New New World, the New World Translation, written by a yeah. man who translated basically the Greek and the Hebrew Bible himself with no help, but he didn't know Greek or Hebrew. But he, but he has this special not knowing from God that allows him to be able to do it, right? <laughs> okay. The third one, let me get through this so I can get through all of this, right? Third one is docetism. And docetism is defined as any teaching that claims that Jesus's body was either absent or illusory, which means that Jesus really was never physically present, right? His body was an illusion. 
They didn't nail a real body to the cross. That was just an illusion, right? So in one, in one variation of this, uh, Christ is so divine that he could not have been human, right? Because God lacks a material body, right? God is spirit. They that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. So if God lacks a material body and Jesus is equal with God, then Jesus can't have a physical body. So what we saw in those three and a half years, I had really 33 and a half years, right? Was not Jesus really suffering, right? He only appeared to be flesh and blood and his actual body was what they call a phantasm. He was a ghost, right? He wasn't really flesh. Of course, if he's not flesh, then, then there's no need for him to die on the cross. As a matter of fact, no real body was on the cross if he's not flesh. And of course, then there's no need for a resurrection because you didn't really bury a body because there was this phantasm. So docetism does not believe in the physical body. Now, we have some of that within the Christ consciousness movement who said, who will say, you know, that the, that the cross is really unnecessary. You know, I, I know a preacher who took the cross out of his church and buried it in the backyard of, of the church. I said, we don't need it. We don't need the cross because if you can raise your mind to the consciousness of Jesus, because that's the spirit is what's important and not the body. So that's docetism. The spirit is important and not the body, right? Then there, there's some other docetists who will say that Jesus was a man in the flesh, but Christ is a separate entity. And Christ entered Jesus when, the, when he was baptized and the dove came out of heaven and landed on him saying, this is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. And it is at that point that he is empowered to perform the miracles, right? And to do all the other stuff. And then that same power, that same spirit, when he is nailed to the cross, when it gets dark, that is the visual picture of the power of God leaving the body. So Christ left when Jesus was nailed to the cross. So you got two extremes, right? Two extremes. Any question? Reverend. Yes. Uh, do we have any sects, uh, sect or or that, uh, Christians that mm -hmm. are similar to this docetism today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do. Can That's you? That's my next slide. That's my oh. next slide. Oh, okay. All right. So in our day, it's more likely for people to deny the deity of Jesus than it is his humanity. Right, but you still get this dualism of Gnosticism and Docetism together. Christian Science is a is a Docetic faith. L. Ron Hubbard, right, that whole Scientology movement is a Docetic faith, right? Anytime we we lift the spiritual. Above the physical, we may find ourselves falling prey to these dueling uh, philosophies. So, for instance, we believe that, you know, that man is, you know, soul and spirit, all right, all right, uh, body and soul. And that doesn't get separated until death. Right. So for Christian scientists, they will say, well, you don't you don't need to go to the doctor. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, you got COVID. You don't need to you know, you don't need no shots. You don't need to go uh, go to a doctor for that disease. You know, you wouldn't even have that disease if your spirit was right. So if you can get your spirit in the right place, you're illness will be cured right and again we see a lot of that stuff. 
right, going around from from denomination to denomination and from sect to sect. Uh, but again, to me, the, the probably the biggest ones are the, the Christian scientists. Most of these uh, self-healing denominations fall into that category. Uh, and, and you get a lot of it in the new age. You know? And there's this rising spiritualism uh, today, uh, probably really kicked up in the pandemic where, where, where folks were saying, you know, uh, they say now, like, for instance, like uh, Generation X, that you know, they're not in church. But, but the, the data suggests that many of them are more spiritual than the people who are in church. Well, that's because they're elevating their, the, this spiritual concept above the idea that in my body, I need to engage in this in, the, in an order of, of, of life and practice uh, and worship, right? So I can do my worship in my own truth wherever I am. I can be like George Foreman. I can baptize myself in the shower after I got off the canvas when Ali hit me hard. Right. Right. So you can do, you know, those kind of things. But we understand uh, as Christians that our bodies do matter because they're the temple of God. Right. This world matters. Because God made it and he made us stewards of this world. Right. And if we deny that the world has meaning and that the body is not important, then we fall into these Gnostic philosophies uh, and we. You know, we, we're, we're drifting away from the Bible. And it is those, you know, those kinds of influences in the early church that we see, I think, springing up again today in the 21st century church. Right? And again, if we don't know our history, even the history of the church, you know, we, we won't know that all this stuff has been dealt with thousands of years ago. Right. And we've come to some real definitive conclusions about it, right? So it's nothing new. People were asking questions about Jesus and who he was immediately after his death and resurrection, right? Acts, the epistles, Peter and Paul lay out for us Christology. What is it we believe about Jesus? Who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what it means to be a follower of or a believer in Jesus. And again, we had a lot, all those things I lifted up tonight, Gnostics, you know, the uh, Docetists, and, uh, and the Arians, all of those things were challenges to what we believe about Christ, right? Again, Arius portrayed Jesus' divinity as lesser than the Father. Mm -hmm. It made him more, more human. So the church, in its early, you know, first 400 years, you know, 350, had to figure out what it believed about Christ. From the time the apostles <clears throat> passed off, they were left with the word of the apostles, the writing of Paul, and now they had to figure out what all that meant in terms of what we believe about Jesus when we no longer have these eyewitnesses and these other folks around. So in 325, they called together a council uh, called the Council of Nicaea, where the leaders of the church from all around the globe came together to discuss, debate, argue, and settle in on what is our common belief about Jesus. And they settled in on what they called then the Nicene Creed, right? That creed has been adjusted uh, for several councils after that, but the bottom line of it is basically they came to this conclusion and it's still pretty much practiced and believed in all Orthodox churches today. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only son of God, begotten of the father before all ages. God from God, right? Not God creating God or a lesser God. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of the same essence as the Father, 
right? Y'all hear me use that word? Uh, I like to throw it around. It makes me sound smart. Homo <laughs> All right? Same stuff. He is, they basically said, we believe Jesus Christ is the same stuff as God. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human, right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again. Sound like a Baptist preacher right there. Third day he rose again according to the scripture. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. That's the Nicene Creed. That's the basic belief about Jesus held by the Christian church. We may have a whole lot of other practices about how we work that out, but if we're really Christian, this is what we believe. So it helps us to understand whether we're dealing with a denomination who is free in its expression or whether we're looking at a cult or a schism or a sect that falls far, uh, far from this basic belief. This, is, this belief about who Jesus is is what unifies us as Christians. And the Nicene Creed is accepted as authoritative by the Roman Catholic Church the Eastern Orthodox Church, and you know they split, right? The Anglican Church, which split from the Roman Catholic Church, and every major Protestant denomination in existence. This is what we believe. This is our Christology, all right? Any questions or comments? I'm done. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. I told you we need that extra half. <laughs> right. And so we're going to be doing this the next two weeks, just like this. All right. Next week, we'll talk about soteriology. That is the doctrine of salvation. What does it mean to be saved? How is one saved? All right. And we're going to find out we got the same kind of issue running from the early church all the way up to the modern church today, where we run into these same kind of different beliefs and understanding right and our our goal our responsibility is to get to the point where we discover what is it that a real christian believes because we're all unified in our belief <laughs> the expression of that belief certain practices and practices in worship may be different but they don't change our basic belief and this is the point that I'm trying to get across to all those who are saying, well, you know, you Baptist, you go into hell. Mm -hmm. You Kojic, you, you got an automatic ticket to heaven. <laughs> all right. All right. Because you tarry and speak in tongues. No, that's, that's, that's not the truth. The truth, what gets us there is what we believe about Jesus. What we believe about salvation. What we believe about the Bible. About his word. Right? Okay. I'm all done. <laughs> wow. Thank you. I learned a lot tonight. This is all right. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Thank, you. Thank you. Amen. Uh, Sister Adrian, you want to give us a word of prayer? Dismiss us tonight. Sure. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come tonight to study your word, to study those things that we need, didn't know or needed better understanding. Thank you for Sister Amanda bringing this to pastor's attention because it is very important that we know all these other religions, are the, these other groups that are around us and among us. Lord, help us to be able to tell them what we know about you that is in your word, not what we believe or think on our own. Help us to stay strong and stay focused on you Help us to help each other as we study your word. Lord, thank you for Pastor, for him bringing this to us and all the work that he's done to put this together. Lord, we ask as we 
get off the line and move on tonight with, our, with all we have to do. Help us to get a restful evening and get started on a new day, fresh and relaxed. These things we ask in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Good night.